Hey, what's up, everyone? This is David Greenspan, and you are listening to Season 3 of the Mindshare Podcast, a proud member of the Industry Syndicate Media Network. Additional podcasts are available at Mindshare101.com and on all the major podcast platforms. This week's episode is sponsored by Kids Keep in Touch Systems and the Buzz Conference. Make sure you connect with the Buzz Conference by visiting their website, www.thebuzzconference.com, and by following them on Instagram at at the Buzz Conference to keep tabs on all the awesome events they host, along with getting the latest copy of the Buzz Digital Magazine. The Buzz Conference is a leading voice in our real estate industry. And Kits, Kits offers a fully loaded cross-channel marketing suite for the real estate industry, including CRM, websites, action plans, newsletters, email blasts, social media content, and so much more, all to help you manage your business, generate more leads, drive more referrals, and of course, build that mindshare so that you can get even more market share. You can learn more on my site, mindshare101.com, by clicking on marketing. And as you know, we are on a push to get to 100 reviews on iTunes, and so I'd like to ask you, if you haven't yet, please take two minutes, go to iTunes, give us a big five-star rating, leave us a really nice review. It really is that easy. And of course, let me say thank you in advance. Today's episode is number 145. She is the founder and chief executive officer of the Real Estate Staging Association. RISA is a nonprofit trade association for professional real estate stagers. Through her work there, she has created an internationally recognized accreditation system for core business staging training providers, an MCE program for real estate agents, the Home Staging Industry Awards, RISACon annual conventions, RISA Connect events, as well as a united network of professional real estate stagers that includes over 2,100 members, 50 chapters, and 250 leaders. As an expert leader, visionary, author, business strategist, global speaker, and an expert on real estate staging, she is one of the real estate industry's most sought-after speakers. She also co-authored Amazon's bestseller, Home Staging, The Power That Sells Real Estate. Her accolades include the Central Valley's Women's Council of Realtors Business Woman of the Year, the Staging and Design Network Leader of the Year, a two-time Stevie Award for Women in Business Finalist, and the host of Stager Talk, a real estate staging podcast. She's a motivating and thought-provoking business strategist who has helped thousands of real estate entrepreneurs navigate the obstacles that are holding them back, as well as to realize their own potential. And she teaches entrepreneurs to leverage the law of attraction and the power of focus combined with their natural talents and passion for their businesses in order to achieve the business they desire. Her no-nonsense direct approach allows her clients to take a step back from their business and really see what works, what needs to be done, and what, how to get to the next level. Then she helps them outline the strategy to make it all happen. This week on the show, I am joined by founder and CEO of RISA, the Real Estate Staging Association, Shell Broadnax. Shell, welcome to the Mindshare Podcast. Thank you for having me. Gosh, re- listening to all that back makes me sound like I've been a little busy bee. Yeah, well, I was going through it. I was like, wow, that is a lot of stuff. Like, seriously, I mean, like, really, when we look, like, you, you were involved in a ton of different initiatives. Like, what's your actual daily focus? Oh gosh, putting out fires. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's just making making the world go round. That's what Seriously. we do. Right, right. But like throughout the day though, I mean, with everything that you got going on, I mean, you're you're obviously talking to a lot of people every single day. Yeah. Where's, we, where's where is the focus? Like, is it creating stuff, helping people build the biz? Like what what are you what are you doing? Well, my day to day, you know, I'm the CEO of the trade association. So we're similar to the National Association of Realtors, but for stagers. So the day to day is just overseeing everything. So what we're working on right now today, we just have an annual meeting of our members. Uh, we're going to be launching a CE program for real estate stagers and new membership levels. And that'll be in uh, 2022. So it's prepping for that. It's takes a year to plan the convention. It takes a year to every month you work on the award. So it's literally every single day, there's just something to do and you shampoo, rinse, repeat all the annual events. And then you sprinkle in one to three initiatives per year because it literally takes that long to build something. And yeah. uh, you just keep massaging it and keep tending the garden and watching it grow. So you're constantly out there communicating with different people, coming up with new initiatives to help this association grow and help the people within it become better at what they do. Um, Tell us then around that, like, 
Um, why recess? So why is there an association? And more, not, not that, you know, we're naive to the fact of why should be there, but just to hear from, from you. Um, and then how, you know, what is Risa doing to help stagers really grow their business out there? And again, you, you sort of just labeled off some of that stuff, but, you know, for anybody that's not aware. For sure. So back in the day, should we say, because I'm yeah. an original. Is that like uh, last year, like yesterday or like we're no, back in the way, way. <laughs> So I got into the industry about 2002. And uh, there was no associations. Uh, there was no unity in our industry. Uh, I worked for a company that uh, taught people how to become stagers. And we also taught real estate agents about staging. And there was really just one major training program, educational platform in the industry. And I helped grow that company for about six and a half years. I'm super proud of all my accomplishments. Um, but it was time to move on. And the industry just kept putting these messages in front of me, they're like little breadcrumbs. If you pay attention, you could just gobble them right up. You know, it's like you're Hansel and Gretel walking through the forest and you see all the things right in front of you. But instead of getting to an evil witch at the end of the breadcrumbs, you, <laughs> you throw something beautiful. So back in the day, one of the things that uh, what, before Facebook, there was a uh, river on active rain. I know Active Rain, yeah. Active Rain. So a lot of stages were on Active Rain initially, and we had a group on Active Rain, and we just started to form some community. And then everybody was just inundating me with messages, hundreds of people saying, we need unity, we need this, we need that. But nobody really put the name on it about really what it was. So um, I did a bunch of research and uh, pooled hundreds of people Um and worked with, at that point, there were now other educational providers that had come on scene and uh, talked to everybody and said, hey, I think what people mean is they need a trade association like NAR. So if you, we want more legitimacy in our industry and actually to make it a functioning industry that has value and layers to it um, and legs and things that improve the overall real estate industry in general, we need to form it. We need to formalize. We need to organize. So we got together, formed a nonprofit association. We're federally tax exempt, so we don't have to pay federal taxes because we're out there for the betterment of the industry. And it just kind of grew from there. And we started with about 600 people um, and a bunch of different training providers. Now they are all under one roof. They market with us. We all support and, and uh, help each other grow everybody's businesses. But then for the stager, we're bringing to them core education. While we don't write the education and we don't provide it, what we do is we accredit the training providers. So we had developed a accreditation program to make sure that educational providers were meeting some standards in the industry because not all education is created equally. So mm -hmm. anybody could literally just throw up a shingle and say, hey, I'm going to teach you how to do X, Y, Z. But a lot of things were being left out. And we had a company come on scene that spent millions of dollars on advertising with HGTV and ripped off people in the industry, thousands of people. So I said, I can't even sleep at night until I can do something to try to prevent that from happening in the future. So I wrote the accreditation program. So we'll review their programs, make sure they meet our standards, give them our accreditation, our seal of approval, so to speak. And the point of that is to make sure that stagers um, can be rest assured that if they see the RISA accreditation, that they're dealing with a legitimate organization that has great policies, procedures. We've looked at all of that, that policies, procedures, fiscal soundness, their content. We've just kind of reviewed everything. And then how we help stagers grow their businesses is that we put on uh, monthly professional development webinars, newbie webinars, there's training, there's annual events. We have our awards, our recognition for our leaders. We have leadership opportunities. So we have chapters throughout the U.S. and Canada. There's just always a plethora of um, opportunity that we provide to stagers to help them market their businesses and build their brands. And so, so, I mean, it's fully, fully loaded there. And is this one of those things yeah. that if I'm in the staging business, I should be part of, I need to be part of, I mean, we could argue like both of those. Yes. Um, sure. But are there are a lot of people still that, that maybe are not, and maybe it's just a, they're not aware or B they don't realize the value that's there for them. Yeah, I would say that's it. Um, okay. I, any stager that's in an industry should join their trade association. Right. Photographers have associations, yeah. mortgage lenders, real estate agents. So real estate agents understand the concept of belonging to your trade association because they all belong. The majority of them do. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be a realtor, you have to belong. If you're not a realtor, you're just a real estate agent. So they understand that language and they understand being organized. And there's so much more that people can do when you're formally organized as an industry because rising tides raise all boats, you know? Mm -hmm. So they definitely want to get involved, especially a new stager because they don't know what they don't know. So we can right. 
you know, shorten that time frame of their education and level them up quicker. Gotcha. So it's like it, once somebody sort of decides that this is the path they want to go down as a career, this association is something they they really should be a part of so that they can really get their 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 feet wet, start to learn, start to understand. You know, like none of us know what we I mean, we don't know what we don't know right. until we know. So the whole thing here would be get involved with with Risa. And now you will find out all those things that you should know. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So is there is there is there a fee to be part of it? There is uh, membership. Remarkably, it's only 190 bucks a year for a general membership. Yeah, uh, it's uh, for a buck ninety a year. It's like nine dollars and twenty two cents a month. I think is what my memory serves. Yeah. Uh, so two cups of coffee and you're in, and you get like I said, a minimum of twelve webinars. Um, they actually do about a minimum of twenty four a year. And of course, we give discounts, but discounts is not a reason to join a trade no. association. It's not one hundred and ninety dollars. Networking. No all of that stuff that goes into it. So even if people are interested in the industry and they're not sure if they want to get in, I actually offer a career counseling call where anybody can give me a ring. I'll get on the phone for 30 minutes and answer all your questions. And I will either scare you out of it or um, encourage you into it. Now, are, are you, I mean, as busy as you are, are you doing staging during a day? Oh, sweet Jesus. No. <laughs> God, no. Were you selling real estate at all? No. Okay. So no, you've been no, an educating no. part. Like you've been in the education side of this the whole time. Yeah. I'm on the provider services side. No. Now in seriousness, I did start a staging business. So I worked for a training company. So yep. I listened to the training about how to become a stager a thousand times at least right. um, over the years. And uh, when I left that company, it was a natural progression for me. I thought, oh, great. I'm going to start a staging business. But here's the little bitty problem with that is that I don't like to move furniture. <laughs> I don't <laughs> and and I'm going to put a hole in your wall if I try to hang artwork. I'm going yeah. to it just okay. is what okay. it is. So All right. I started my business. I had more business than I knew what to do with in four short months. Every time I'd go, I'd lay on the sale. I'm like, yeah, I nailed it. And then I'm like, oh, crap. Now I got to go stage it. So it was one of those things. I couldn't find a business partner to do the more creative, that part of the creative aesthetic right. aspect of the business. Yep. So I just focus really on the provider services because that's my jam. I want to help people grow their businesses. That's where I fit in. And uh, like I said, nothing good's going to happen if I come stage your home. Yeah, no, no. Listen, okay. <laughs> that's fair enough. So don't hire you to stage. Don't you got it. But hire you to help all the other stagers actually figure out what yes. they're doing. Yeah. I like that one. No, I like that. And 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 you just mentioned, and this was a question I had, but you just kind of gave that away to me at least. Um, well, everybody listening, I guess, but you said Canada and the US. Yes. Is this something though that's also open to like folks overseas? I mean, can anybody join this? Anybody can join okay. Risa. We're primarily a North American organization. So our only our support services are going to focus in North America. We just don't have the bandwidth to be able to research wholesale providers in Italy. Okay. And you know, different types of deals. So we can't be that boots on the ground there. So it's primarily North America. So when you say, hold on, that was interesting right there. So the, the wholesale opportunities and such. So again, if I'm a stager, I guess and I'm, I'm kind of, I'm doing some good probing here, but it's, it's, uh, there will be like a, a library of, of uh, service providers or connections or people that I can go to, to figure out how do I get this? How do I make that happen? There's, there's gotta be a whole directory there, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Which, which, so where you just brought that up around. Yeah. So right? stagers, um, they obviously they're going to bring furniture into a listing. If it's vacant, right. they're bringing every single stick of furniture in. Right. So instead of them going to a, a retail furniture store, I just always say love it. So it comes to mind. I'm so old. I don't even know if they have that anymore. Um, but you go to a big box store and you can buy retail. So you can buy that sofa for $3,000 retail, but well, you're a business owner, buy it wholesale. So get a resale certificate, resale license. They call it different things in different areas. And then you can go buy that $3,000 sofa for maybe 800 bucks. So the good news with Risa is what I do is that I go in and I negotiate on behalf of the industry and ask that the wholesale providers where a stager could walk into their showroom and say, okay, I want your, you know, $15,000 worth of merchandise, they're going to get it and they're going to get it at their designer showroom pricing, which is still a wholesale. But through Risa, they're going to give my members an additional discount off of that. And sometimes even off the next layer, which is called stocking dealer pricing. So they really get great wholesale pricing options going through our buying group. And it's part of their membership when they join us. It's not an additional fee for that. So that helps them become more profitable quicker 
because that sofa has got to pay for itself and then you've got to turn it and then you get into profit mode with your inventory, with your assets. So they're going out, they're buying the furniture, they're storing the furniture, they got to put it somewhere. But what they're doing is they're picking a whole bunch of stuff that they feel is going to make a house look really good. Go and pick that up, get it for a, you know, a discounted price based on the buying power of the group. Right. And now they've got those, you know, those, those, those furnitures, those assets to be able to bring into a home. And like you just said, it's that idea of put it in there, you know, get your first few deals. And now you're just turning profit the rest of the time for it. Exactly. Right. Interesting. Eh? So that's it. I mean, the fact that you guys go out there and actually make those calls, make those connections, make those directories, that, that in and of itself is powerful. I mean, we look at the real estate industry and where realtors are getting their business from. And I mean, you know, for, for years, and it's always still been, and it still remains, it's your contact list. It's the people that know you, like you trust you, period. Right. Um, but there is something to be said about prospecting and going out and finding new business and finding new connection points. And that takes work. You know, that that's dirty work right there. So you guys are really doing a lot of dirty work, which is beneficial in a massive way for the stagers. Yeah, absolutely. This was right? groundbreaking because yeah. 10 years ago, the wholesale providers wouldn't speak to stagers. And I know because I called them for six years in a row. Every year, annually, I would start making phone calls. So I started out with like the Las Vegas furniture market saying, look, I've got a group of stagers I want to bring in. They need to buy wholesale. I got people that are your target. We need to work together. And they just weren't getting it. And I mean, I'm pretty persuasive kind of chick, you know? So I'm like, what are they not getting? So I'm like, I can speak a Russian to this chick. What is it? Finally, on year seven, I got a phone call. And she was like, Shell, this is at Las Vegas market. And I'm like, oh my God, it's happening. It's happening. All my work. She knows who I am because I pester her once a year. And she's like, she literally said to me, so, um, yeah, so I know you've been calling me every year for a few years now. Yeah, a few, like six. She's like, yeah. And I just, I don't know what it was, but it was just had this mental block. I wasn't getting it. And she's like, I think I got it. And I'm like, oh, thank you, sweetheart. Welcome. Let's work. <laughs> so it's like, now it's a beautiful relationship. We've got all these deals, but you know, 10 years ago, stagers would want to buy wholesale and they couldn't even get their foot in the door because the furniture vendors wouldn't sell to them because a lot of them say you have to spend $25,000 with us before you can order from us. They have minimum orders. So that's the other good thing about what I negotiate is I get rid of those minimum orders. Right. Or I get them so low that it's a no brainer, like a few hundred bucks, a thousand bucks. But the idea to the wholesaler is the fact that you're going to, you're basically going to advertise them and promote them to this massive uh, association of people that can go and actually leverage them. Yep. Bring your business through their doors. Exactly. So they buy the inventory from the wholesalers. The stagers get the less better than wholesale pricing, which makes them profitable. I married them together. It's a win-win. It's a trifecta of winning. Yeah, seriously. So now you 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 wrote a book, an Amazon best-selling book, yeah. um, called "The Power That Sells Real Estate," and I love that. And I stole that for the title of our show today. Um, but <laughs> tell us what what is the book all about? Well, it's just about why it is that staging works, and it was co-authored. So there's different chapters by different industry professionals. Okay. It's yep. a great read. Um, it just really hones in on why it's important to stage and getting the point across. So it's very digestible. It's in uh, one chapter at a, well, books are one chapter at a time, but one subject matter at a time within the industry. So it's more into bite-sized pieces that are very easily read. And this is, this is a, a book for stagers to read, for realtors to read, for Who's both. this for? For both. both. Real estate okay. agents would greatly benefit from this book. Okay. Um, but stagers as well, because it's going to give them information. It'll give them information on how they can communicate the power of, of staging as well. But primarily, it's really great for real estate agents. So, so that they understand why, right? Yeah, now, exactly. It, in much to say, when we talk about those courses that you created and we talk about the accreditations, and we, you know, we talked about the, the, the education portion of it around stagers really learning the right things. Um, you also do a lot of speaking and I know, you know, these past 18 months and all this other stuff, or maybe it's been longer already. I don't even know anymore. Uh, but it's, it's changed our landscape in terms of what we do on a regular basis of being really there on stages with people. Um, I know we even had an event together that was supposed to be in Vegas. It feels like it was the last year, the year before, whatever it was. And, Two years. Yeah. Two years. Right. And like, just like that and had to be canceled because of what's going on. But with that, you know, virtually in person, 
What is your big message to the industry when you're getting out there? Like when you're, I mean, we met at NAR um, and I remember when we met there and, you know, you were doing a talk and, you know, is, is, I guess we all have an underlying theme and message around what we're doing. Um, would this come right back to maybe the whole thing of like why realtors or why, why the real estate industry needs to leverage stagers? Like what's, what's the big message you're getting across to people? Number one, that uh, staging is marketing and merchandising your clients, what's likely their number one asset. Mm -hmm. So when the messaging is really to real estate agents to get them to understand that, you know, they all have a fiduciary duty uh, to act in the best interest of their clients, but yet so many of them don't even recommend staging. They don't look into staging. And then a lot of them will say, you don't need staging. It's going to sell anyway. And that is going to get somebody in trouble. We are waiting for the day where there is a big lawsuit about this, because let's think about this. Say you're in a, in a neighborhood and uh, they're all similar floor, floor models. You know, every fourth house is a, the mm -hmm. same floor model. And uh, you've got one on one block, one at the end of the block. They both go to for sale. One agent recommends staging and their client stages the listing. The same floor model a block away, that agent says, it's a seller's market. Don't worry about it. it's going to sell anyway. Mm -hmm. And then the person that staged it, I'm just going to use round numbers, sells for 50 grand over list price. And the other one doesn't. And then that client is looking at their agent going, wait a minute, my friend up the street, it's the same floor model as mine. Why did that sell for 50 grand more and mine didn't? And then they talk to that person up the street. How did you get 50,000 more? And she, oh, we staged it. Mm -hmm. Look at the photos. And then the one that didn't is saying, what's staging? Why didn't you tell me about staging agent? You're, why would you not share this with me? And we know this is just, it's just waiting to happen because there are so many uneducated real estate agents out there. And they don't, I don't think a lot of them, especially the newbies, they don't have a real firm understanding of the fact that this is a fiduciary responsibility. They need to be looking out for their client's best interest. So staging is going to be less stressful. It's going to um, help them with the sales process. It's going to make the agent look like a rock star. And, you know, in a still market, when nothing's moving, a staged house is going to sell. And in a hot market, when everything's selling, no matter how horrible it looks, it's going to sell quicker. It's going to have more offers than everything else. And it's going to sell for more money. So it's really about educating that particular agent and making sure that they understand it. So they should always present it to their client as a positive option. And the client should have the right to be able to accept it or reject it at that point. But it's my belief that for sure that an agent has a fiduciary responsibility to present it as an option. You know, I, I think it through and I go through with folks that we coach and train and, and all the people that we talk to on a regular about, you know, service packages and offerings and, you know, what are you doing to really win the listing? And, and, you know, people are cutting commission like crazy or people are offering, you know, I'll buy your house if it doesn't sell within, or I'll send you on a vacation or I'll stage it for free or whatever. Um, you know, when we look at that, I guess one of the things in a service offering is the fact that everything has a cost to the realtor. Right. And so in there, I think that I, I'd like to say that most people are um, making the suggestion to get staging, but I also know that in a lot of cases, there's a lot of agents that go, yeah, I don't, I don't spend the money on that. You know, the client can spend the money on that. If they want to have it, I will suggest it. Some realtors go, I've already got all the stuff there. You know, I do it all on my own. I bring in my team and we come and do it. Um, and then there's obviously, you know, the, I've got a partner who's a stager who's going to come in and do this for us. Um, that being said, though, I think it really comes back to that, that sort of listing services package of are they putting it out there at that point going, look, when I come list your house, here's what I do. And I think that that's, um, it's one of those leg ups. It's one of those value adds that you put in there. Now it's just a matter of the cost around that, right? So again, we know that staging a house is going to help the house sell. It's just, it's going to make it look pretty on pictures. It's going to make people walk in and go, oh my God, this looks amazing. And people are going to be able to envision the home with all of this nice furniture, be it that furniture or their furniture, being able to see it better as opposed to it being like bare, as opposed to right. it having like old grimy furniture, this stuff's going to make it look good. So right. again, we know that. Um, so then from, from there, you know, assuming that um, realtors understand why to leverage the stager, right? And very high level house is going to look better. It's going to help you sell for more money. What are some of the non-negotiables, the need to do's when it comes to staging a house? Oh boy. <laughs> it's got to be clean, man. I'm telling you, um, it has got to be clean. 
it, this is this is what I want people to understand. Y'all are selling what's your number one asset. And think about this. It, you, you don't want garage sale pricing. You don't want to mark down your pricing after you've got it listed. And we talk about the cost of staging the initial investment. Um, we definitely don't promote that agents should should pay for the staging at all. I don't believe personally, I for sure don't believe it. Now, many in super hot markets, many agents do. And that's great because they know when they're making money hand over fist, it makes, you know, if it's something sells for 200,000 over list price, are they going to squabble over investing five grand to pay for the staging? I think not. However, we do recommend that the sellers pay for it because it's their investment. It's their nest egg. It's their equity in the home. Um, But it absolutely has to be clean. It's got to be clutter free. You want to update as much as you can. Remember, again, you're asking somebody else to come in and buy something from you that is used. So you got to spruce it up. Give it zhuzh it up a bit, as I say, zhuzh it up. Because in reality, if you're going to sell your Toyota Corolla, I'm pretty sure you're going to take it down to the car wash. You're going to pay your teenager 20 bucks to go out there and wash it and get it detailed and shine it up. You invest more in in selling a used car than you do in your number one asset, which is going to make you more money than you would be on the car. So it just makes so much sense. But definitely... clearing it out, getting rid of stuff. You have to pack anyway. You're going to move anyway. So pack up your extra stuff. That way there's minimal things in the home. You don't want to look sparse and empty. You still want to look good and inviting. But you know, if you have bookshelves and you've got 10,000 books or 10,000 DVD collections, pack them up, sister, because you don't need them right now. So let's move them out, get them out of there. And then, of course, do some beautiful staging to highlight the architecture of the home. Just make it look more appealing. And especially for the photos, you don't use professional photography on top of the staging. It's a total waste. Um, These iPhone cameras just don't cut it, even though they're they're great these days. Get professional photography. It's the icing on the cake. It's like... The comparison to the car makes total sense, right? You would not try yeah. to sell your car that's dirty, muddy. You know, you haven't vacuumed it. You haven't, you know, windexed the, you know, mirrors and glass and all that stuff. You see, that's the exact same idea. Yeah. Right. Now, um, somebody had asked here, you know, what about um, options for small towns where stages are not necessarily available? They might be further away from big cities. Is there are there options to that in any way? You know, is that, is that, Hey, go, go get your own supply and have it on hand somewhere. What would you say about that? Actually, there's a lot of things that you can do. Number one, um, research stagers in your area. So if you go to Google and you say, and find whatever your geographic area is referred to, sometimes people have geography referred to a certain area. So you might say like upstate South Carolina or San Francisco Bay area or GTA. Um, so you do home stagers, GTA, home stagers, Toronto, And uh, you search that way. And if you're on the outskirts of that main area, a lot of them may travel to that particular area. So you're going to number one call, find out if they service your particular area. Now, for some reason, you're calling around and you don't find any stagers that do service your area. Don't fret, especially if you are going to be living in your home while it's listed, because then you can call somebody that's not in your area and you can do a consultation virtually. So what you would do is you would take your phone and you would walk around the house with the video and you can go live and you can film everything as you're walking through and the stager can give you direct uh, feedback, what to to clear out, what to pack up, what to move away. Um, Then you can still still photos as well. And then they can follow up afterwards with a little report via email, or they can do everything through the walk and talk through to a camera on the phone. So they can still help you with that. Now, if it's vacant, and they're not coming to your area, they're not coming to your area. And then it kind of is what it is. So if you have the ability to make something look like it comes out of architectural digest, great. But then you may be investing a lot of money into the actual furniture, which may not be a good option for you. So you have to really weigh what your equity look like, mm-hmm. but call a stage or get a consult. They'll be able to tell you the best thing that you can do um, for your situation. Now, in that case, you guys obviously have a directory, you've got chapters, you've got members all over the place. Um, yeah. I mean, another option I'd throw out there, I think you might have just thrown, like, connect with Risa, figure out, you know, hey, I'm, I'm in this area, here's where I'm at, do we have anybody close by? Absolutely. Right, that'd be an option. What's your take, uh, and this one just came to mind as that question was asked, what's your take on the whole idea around the virtual staging? Because you just brought up doing the virtual thing, we know that there's companies out there that are like, you know, from, from a digital perspective, I mean, you walk in the house and stuff won't be there, but from a digital perspective, they can make the floors and the walls and the this and the that, and even put furniture in places. Um, 
any any thoughts on that? Something that you guys do don't recommend or or yeah, absolutely. So here's the thing: if staging mm-hmm. the property, if the goal is to be able to have the buyer to have an emotional connection when when they walk through that door, virtual staging is never going to do that right. because it's going to be an empty, naked house once they get there. Now, sometimes virtual staging as well, they will change wall color and take walls out, and and you you see that online, and then you get to the home and you're like. Really? Well, is that, this the same place? Yeah, exactly. That wall, that, right. Where's the wall there? The wall's over here. It's not over here. So they get a very, they get a letdown. So it's a little bit of a bait and switch mm-hmm. concept. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, there are plenty of times for sure when virtual staging could be a benefit, um, especially maybe if you're, you know, selling to an investor. And even with staging, there's sometimes you're not going to stage a home. So let's look at investment properties. Those are properties, you know, if, if it's going to have to be rehabbed and, and built back up, you don't want, don't put them the money into staging, get it sold to a flipper, to an investor. They're going to put the money into um, doing all the reno on it. And then they're the ones that will stage it because then they can sell it for more money. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. So I asked you about the, you know, non-negotiables, the to do's, what would you say are some of the non-negotiables like do not do's when it comes to staging a house? I mean, it's the total opposite, you know, don't leave the place dirty. Don't, you know, turn on the lights, fix the light bulbs, I imagine. But is there anything that that comes to mind there where it's like, listen, big red flag or stuff we've seen that is just absolutely like, do not do it. Anything that comes to mind, sort of just top of mind there? Yeah. In a vacant listing, I see these all the time. They do what we call vignettes or some people call them light staging. Okay. It's bullshit. What don't do it. What is it? It's vignettes where they're going to take a wing back chair and a book and a throw and a broken down ficus tree from Michael's. And they're going to sit it next to a fireplace and they're going to like, Oh, I staged it. I'm like, no, you didn't. You made it look horrible. <laughs> or they just do put some fluffy towels in the laundry room, or they just make just a little thing that would make a great picture of something, but the whole, the rest, the rest of the room is naked and empty. So vignettes make it look empty and unprofessional. In addition, when stagers take that on, people walk through it and they're like, what is this? It's warming up the space. No, it doesn't warm up the space. It makes it look undone. So if you can't afford to do the, the whole staging, I don't recommend doing the vignettes at all. I would totally stay away from that as a business model for a stager and as an agent to recommend it as a homeowner to do it. I would not recommend that you do it at all. Um, the other thing with staging is that a lot of times it does involve some upgrades. So if it's, if the budget is there to be able to like upgrade the countertops in the kitchen, um, I just sold my house a, uh, June 2019. And uh, we redid the kitchen counters. So we did LG High Max. It was a Lowe's product, um, or maybe it was Home Depot, one of the two. And um, we put that in. So it was more of a lower cost for the budget that we were doing. It still made it look amazing. But uh, one of the do nots is don't spend 50 grand on renovating a kitchen unless you know you're going to get that back. So if it's a lower end home or an average home, you're not going to put that much into it because you're not going to make that money back. Now, if you're looking at an Uber luxury listing, 50 grand on a kitchen kitchen reno is no big deal. You might get your money back in that. So it's very important to spend the money wisely and don't spend it where you don't need to do it and don't do vignettes. Those are two big things. Okay. So just talking to money then, well, well, what kind of cost is it to, I mean, or is this like wide open when I say, what kind of cost is it to, like, what's the average cost of staging a house? Yeah, that's kind of hard to do. So it's hard, right? people, okay. it, well, it's hard. You're going to say yeah, yeah. anywhere from a thousand to a hundred thousand dollars. So there's right. a big scope there. So yeah. we'll just talk averages, you know, your everyday people, let's say you got a three or four bedroom home, 2,500 square feet, depending on where you're located in North America, that can run you anywhere from maybe uh, depending on the amount of rooms, again, that you stage, if you do, do your main There's spaces. so many variables. I completely like, like t- to total disclaimer. Grand. There's a lot of the variables, lot of variables. in what you're saying, hundred percent. Two to five grand. But think okay. of it like this. We talk about what's the cost of staging. Okay, let's just use round numbers. Five grand. Did that really cost you anything if you made $30,000 oh, back? That, and that's, that's the flip side too, right? Because if you can raise free. the value of the house right back to the initial example you shared before of the house down the street and the house here, if you can raise that value by 30, 40, 50 Gs, just by investing, investing $5,000, now you're going to get your money back tenfold. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Makes total sense. Makes total sense. So, so, okay. So here then <clears throat> what, what are, uh, what are some of the hottest trends right now when it comes to staging? Like are, 
Are there trends? I mean, I could imagine that if I sat there being sort of naive on the whole thing saying, you know, a trend would be um, the types of furniture that's going in these days. You know, there's certain like looks of furniture, certain colors of furniture. Um, You know, we know our whites are more popular these days than our browns are. But, you know, 10 years ago, brown was like the, the thing, like the different shades of it. Right. So what what are some of those trends maybe that people should be paying attention to or some of those big things that are like, again, we talked about the non-negotiables, but you know what I'm saying here? Like, like the, what would be trending and staging right now, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. People are furniture. asking for, people are doing, right? Yes. Well, people don't really ask for it because in reality, here's the beauty about staging. So it doesn't matter what the homeowner wants or likes. It doesn't matter what the real estate agent wants or likes. Completely irrelevant. And much mm. of the time, uh, you might want to do the opposite because it's not about your personal taste. If I had my personal taste, I'd have everything, you know, rustic. And look like a log cabin, right. uh, but you know you're not going to go around and do that for everything. But right. furniture absolutely trend. So a couple of years ago, the uh, turquoise was very very big. Turquoise in color, and every year you know Pantone and Sherwin Williams they all come out with your colors of the year. And right now metals, mixed metals are really trending. So anytime if you go in even to an average furniture store, you're going to see probably really what's trending there. So stagers will bring things in that are trending, but you they also do it in a way with their inventory that it's not the same look in every single home that they do because they can accessorize differently. Uh, but it's just really things happen to go with a lot of the paint colors, but then even again, paint color is something stagers really need to know about. And agents should really be aware about not making a recommendation on paint colors if they really aren't trained on it. Because if you recommend um, shaker beige to a client and it's your, your go-to paint color, people say, what's your go-to paint color? I'm like, there shouldn't be one because light time of day, shadows in your home, all of those things affect your paint color very differently. So if you recommend one paint color and the homeowner does a DIY job or even worse, pays somebody to come in and they spend four grand on painting and then you walk in and it's like, oh my God, this is the wrong color. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue. That's a big, that's a, that's a big financial mistake. Mm -hmm. So you really want to be trained on the paint color options, but paint colors tend to trend, but you don't necessarily want to use a a trending paint color for staging a home because everything is unique. Very interesting thought process there. You know what? It's a great point that you bring up around even just the color of paint. And I think, I think it goes without saying, but I mean, you know, when you look at some of these, um, virtual tours or, you know, the photo, photo, uh, photographs that they take, they put online, you can tell the uh, angle that the sun is coming in the windows. You can almost tell what, what you know, yeah. direction the house faces, which therefore really does change things up. I mean, when you see something that, um, you know, if I say this, I guess it doesn't matter what direction the house faces so much as like, where's the sun coming through and what time of day, et cetera, et cetera. But you've got a house that's not getting a lot of natural light. Then you bring a color like a a brown in there. And, and I mean, as I say, brown, we're not talking like a dark, dark brown. We're just talking what those lighter kind of colors, whatever it be. But you bring that in with a house that's not getting the color or some sort of darker color. It's going to appear very, very dark. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess those are little things to pay attention to. So, yeah. so what about um, when we look at like the biggest challenges facing this industry? And we'll, we'll, we'll you know, we'll, we'll isolate to obviously stagers. Um, but what are some of those biggest challenges? And, and you know, what can, what can the staging industry or, or stagers do about it? Is there anything that comes to mind there? Well, right now, the, you mean the biggest challenge for stagers in general? Yeah, yeah. So it, this last year, in the last 18 months due to COVID, the biggest challenge they faced was uh, being non-essential. And then once things were opened up, because Risa did um, work with many of the uh, states and provinces in North America to A, figure out were were you essential? Were they not essential? Um, Certain states I petitioned to make stagers essential because they were under contracts. So if a house closed and their inventory was still in it, the new owner owns the inventory. So they need to go and get that out to protect their assets. So I had to petition different states to say, to give our members permission to go out during the initial COVID restrictions, the lockdowns, so they could actually go in and retrieve their furniture. So I actually worked with different states that the governor's office said, your members of your association, only 42 of them in the state of Connecticut, boom, you have permission to wow. leave your home and go get your stuff. So that was a big um, a big problem initially with COVID was that they were on lockdown. And then two, because of COVID, the uh, wholesale 
distribution lines were interrupted. So they couldn't get their inventory because the wholesale providers weren't getting their containers in from overseas. So that was a big thing. So the tariffs hit um, and COVID hit and delays hit and it it is just trickled. So that has been a a big problem in our industry for last year. And unfortunately, nothing stagers can do to fix it. But they did pivot this year when it hit COVID because then they decided, let's, how are we going to work a little differently? So they started doing the virtual consultations and things like that. So they could still keep, keep it churning. Well, and I think that that, you know, as we progress forward, I mean, look, you know, we get on stage, we talk to a lot of people. So getting on a camera and talking to people really doesn't, doesn't, you know, shake the stick so much, right? It's it's easy enough for us. Um, but you got a lot of folks that never really entertained doing this virtual thing with the camera, with getting on a screen. And I mean, I was having a coach call this morning with somebody who said to me, says like, Dave, I could talk to anybody anytime. He says the minute you turn on the camera, it's like a freeze. I don't know what to say. He goes, I don't know why, right? And we know that that's very normal for a lot of people. Yeah. In fact, most people would say like, yeah, I'm scared like to get on a camera. Okay. But we have gotten into a time now where it's important that no matter what you do in business, you are able to leverage getting on this camera so that you can talk to somebody else because there is limitations on being able to go see people and do who knows what's ahead for us in the next coming months anyways, either. Could yeah. it get, you know, could it go back to where it was a few months ago, which we pray and cross our fingers it will not. Right. But this is that 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 moment now where there is that opportunity to embrace. And I mean, you know, my message to anybody on that front as well, Shell, would be. Um, for people that are scared to get on the camera and start leveraging virtual, remember this too. You know, when we first started to ride a bicycle, we made mistakes. When we first started to swim, we made mistakes. There's many things. Walk, we made mistakes. But then now we can all walk. I mean, for the most part, right? Uh, riding a bike, it's one of those things you don't forget. Swimming is one of those things you don't forget. Once you can do, you can do. Much the same when it gets to coming on camera. Everybody's making mistakes at the same time right now. Everybody's learning at the same time right now. And so many people still haven't become comfortable with it. Yeah. So there, I believe there's a big opportunity for anybody that's going to embrace this way of communication and say, look, I'm going to do it. I'm going to step out of my comfort zone, no matter what fears I've got about it, because I know something. When I do it today, and then I do it again tomorrow, when I do it again the next day, I will get better. I yeah. will learn from my mistakes. Right? Yep. So I, I think there's big opportunity in that. Um, now speaking of opportunity, then, uh, outside of the one I just mentioned, what would you say are some of the opportunities that do lie ahead for stagers again in this industry? Well, as things are starting to open up right now, business is booming. Stagers Mm -hmm. are so busy. I I haven't heard uh, any complaints of anybody, uh, not being busy. A few of them are still having some problems getting their inventory from overseas and whatnot, but they're pivoting. So if they have mm-hmm. to buy retail, they're going to run into town and you know buy that three thousand dollars sofa. Buy. They're going to do whatever it takes to be able to get the job done. Um, but right now, you know, let's think. What do we all? What do we both know as business coaches? What is when it's in a down market? What are you supposed to do? Raise your prices twenty mm. percent. You heard it from me, people. Raise your prices twenty percent right now. Because when you come out of this, the price is raised. Nobody thinks That's about right. it as the best thing. And I get so many people saying, oh, my God, I can't do that. No, no, no. And I'm like, if you don't do it, I'm going to stick a fork in your eye. Just do it. Just trust me because it works. It, Jeff, it's, it's proven. It's a proven thing that works. So I would I would consider that an opportunity for people to do it. But um, because everything's opening up, this is a great time to scale your business. So in seriousness, yeah, raise your prices, look at your bottom lines again, add on staff, um, expand. It's the perfect time to do it. You should be on Zoom overload at this point after 18 months. People have really spent a lot of time working on education and doing webinars and conferences online and meeting people online. And um, it's just a great, great opportunity at this point because you're we're seeing a boom again. And be prepared because if you if you're not prepared now, you're going to be left behind. You know, I was watching something with uh, Barbara Kukorin the other day. She was doing a keynote at some other event, and uh, she talks about her like you know eighty different companies or whatever it was. And she said, <laughs> she you know, said. she she well, seriously right, and she made she made comment of um, when COVID hit. And again, this isn't verbatim, so like everybody who's interested, go find it from Barbara, not from David. But um, she mentioned something about the fact that, you know, she got on the horn and she basically called every single one of her, her companies, every business owner that she's got there. And she said, look, here's what I want you to do. And essentially it was, 
scale your business, right? Start to figure out how you're coming out of this, start to figure out what you're doing, you know, to go more, what are you doing to expand and, and all these different things. And, and, you know, call all of your clients and let them know and this and that. She said, you know, here's what I want you to do. Basically gave everybody marching orders. Again, I don't remember the exact number, but it was a dismal number where she basically said, she goes, you know, out of let's say 80 companies, she's like 70 of them didn't listen to me. And she goes, they're out of business. And they're still in business, but to her, it was that thing of like, they're doing nothing to grow and kind of what you just said of that, you know, then she talked about, let's say those 10 businesses that went out and scaled and, and raised prices and brought on staff and sort of pushed forward. She goes, these people did their quote unquote pivot. They figured out a way to adapt. And now they've, they've actually, you know, multiplied their income already, right. Just by those little steps of growth. So there's, you know, a school of thought here around, do I, bury my head and just wait for the storm to pass? Or do I stand out there on the ledge with my umbrella and go, you know what, hit me if you can, but I'm going to keep pushing forward over here and make stuff happen. Because as soon as it does pass, I'm going to be flying way past everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. She's got a lot of great advice. I interviewed her years ago. Um, Yeah. Yeah. There's video all over. Barbara Corcoran, Shell Broadnax YouTube, check it out. Yeah. Great, great interview. Uh, Don't uh, she, she's probably the only person that I had a little bit of nerves with. So I remember in my video in the beginning, my eyes were darting around like this. I was like, Hey, Barbara. And I'm like, why did somebody stop me? Why did the videographer (laughs) say, Shell, keep your eyeballs steady. So we kind of edited that out and did my voice over the top of the introduction. So I get my eyes straight. Yeah. Um, but other than that, she was, she was, uh, I interview all of our keynote speakers, um, through RisaCon and she was able to do in person with me. And I will say that she was one of the, the warmest, uh, biggest celebrities. And I, I've interviewed tons of celebrities. She was one of the most authentic, warm people that I've ever met. She was very, very lovely, lovely That's lady. That's cool. That is very cool. Yeah, no, she's, very uh, fun. You know what? I've read a lot of books and watched a lot of videos from her and, and uh, amongst the many of the people that we, we learn from. Um, she's always got some really great stuff to share. Uh, but I, again, it was, it was a, a very uh, similar paradigm there in way of thinking from what you just said to what she had spoken about in there. So, so Shell Prodnax and Barbara Corcoran recommend that you scale your business. You heard it from us gals first. There you go. I mean, I mean it might have come from Shell first. Maybe Barbara took it from you. I don't know. She, right? she might have, you know. Um, so, so as we look at then the key to growing business, as we talk about growing a business, and we know that that's one of those biggest challenges. And we know that, that even something like fear, fear is one of those things that stops people from doing almost anything in life. It could be jumping in the pool to swim for the first time. Like it's, it's anything. So therefore bringing on staff, bringing on, you know, additional partners, going and sourcing new furniture at this point, when you're so scared of whether or not there's going to be a business tomorrow, just yeah. based on, again, you know, the landscape of what's going on right now. I mean, much the same when we look at the real estate industry, you know, we help people, you know, to grow their business, it's about creating systems and processes. It's about understanding, you know, what are you doing for follow-up? What are you doing for, for prospecting? How are you driving more business? And again, how are you converting that business and nurturing it and turning it into referrals, et cetera? My question is, you know, I guess coupled hand in hand, like what's the keys to growing a successful stage in business and much the same, you know, what are stagers doing to market and grow their business? I'll call it build mind share, right? Like who's their number one audience? Oh, there's a lot to unpack there. Right. Yeah. Um, like it's sort of a let, loaded back, three let, questions in one, but it's, it is. It's, let's talk about fear for just a minute. Okay. So here's the thing with fear is what I found with people is that, uh, say someone like you or I will say, Hey, here's this great idea that I have to help you scale your business. And we present it. And, uh, nine times out of 10, they will say, but I can't do that because I don't have the money because, in four months, this is going to happen. And I don't know how to do this. And I don't have that piece of equipment. And I don't this. And I'm like, okay, first of all, I'm going to turn you upside down, shake your brain around for a minute, pop you on the head and say, let that crap go out because you're focusing on the obstacles instead of focusing on the goal, set your goal, create, and then you work backwards from your goal. This is the goal that I want. Now work backwards. What's the strategy Don't worry about the obstacles, but what would you absolutely have to do in order to hit that goal? That's your strategy. The obstacles aren't there to keep you out. They're there to keep people out who don't want it badly enough. So Mm -hmm. once you hit that and you start focusing on the goal, any obstacle that comes up, you just deal with them one at a time because that's going to help you build your foundation. So you just need to change your mindset on that. Think of it that way. And you just keep building and building and building and building. There's an obstacle in front of you. You just don't sit there and say, 
Um, boy, I thought I had everything turned off here. It's all good. It's all um, good. If you uh, you just don't sit there and say to people, um, there's an obstacle. I can't do anything about it. Of course not. What are you going to do? You're going to blow that sucker up with some C4. You're going to dig a hole underneath it. You're going to scale the top of it. You're going to do whatever you have to do in order to get around the obstacle. Obstacle's done. No big deal. Be able to move on. Everything's great. And so you need to focus on that. So that's how you can kind of do fear. And fear also, it's practice. An old cowboy told me once, I said, you know, I just get so afraid sometimes when I'm going out and I'm chasing that cow on my horse and, and you know, the speed gets to me. And, you know, he looked at me and says, man, you're, you're really down on yourself, Shell. He's like, you're a much better rider than you think you are. It just takes time. It just mm-hmm. takes practice. It's just more, more seats in the saddle. So you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And that's how you also build your confidence, number one. And then I think the second was stagers and how they market their business now. Who's their target market? Mm-hmm. Target market is anybody who needs to sell a house. So real estate agents and homeowners. Now, here's and homeowners, the key. okay. They need to market to homeowners as well because what has happened, we've actually seen a paradigm shift in our industry. In the very beginning, uh, it was only agents that were talking to stagers and stagers right. would only target agents. They would bring the homeowners. Now it's shifted to where the homeowners, because we think HGTV, they now know what staging is. And so now they're seeking out stagers before they even have an agent. So working with homeowners, working with the agents and marketing directly to them will help a stager be able to grow their business. I like that. Okay, cool. See, it's interesting because to me, it was thinking just realtors, but yeah, there it is right there. And, you know, in any marketing and anytime we're trying to build that mind share, the idea is the first, first, first step is to find who's your target audience, just right? Who is that yeah. market that you're going after? And in this case, you said it's both. It's it's the realtor. So the connections you create there, it's also the homeowners, the people you want to go after, right? Um, now, to me, the homeowner is a big, massive pool of people. So I'd still recommend to anybody tuned into this is that, again, when you're thinking about that, think about that market that you service. Think about that hyperlocal area that you go after. Where does most of your business come from? And, you know, the, even the starting point to that could be because would you take the, you know, opportunity if it was 60 minutes away? And if you would, that's fine. So then start, you know, in the first part of it to look at and say, you know, my contact list, who are those people? Let's talk to those people. They may be in a closer demographic to each other or geographic location to each other, pardon me. Those are maybe the people you want to start with and then start to branch out from there, right? And again, it's that whole thing of building a referral business and really growing it. Um, But interesting because it's not just the realtor. So that's cool. Now, as we talk about fear then, and we talk about goal setting and really, you know, having the things you want. And this is something I mentioned from your bio and I know something you talk about um, and something I believe very much in. Law of attraction. Oh, talk to me about subject. that one for a second. Oh, I right, talk about this for six hours. <laughs> I <people>. know. <laughs> uh, law of attraction is not making a freaking wish list and sitting home and waiting for stuff to happen. That's not what this is about. So I will explain it quickly. Is manifestation. It is putting all of your energy and your resource out there and just washing it, just wash back in waves back up on you. When you talk about the law of attraction and let's say let's just work with a vision board for a moment do a vision board i I have one Mm -hmm. i do them often i have one and and you go back to it and you look at your vision board and you're like holy cow oh yeah check off check off you ever go back to them later and you're like no no i look at it every morning it hangs right there on the wall by the bed so it's like the first thing i see when i wake up there you go and i'm telling you the stuff on there shell story the stuff on there that it's already been checked off and it's just the coolest most badass thing to look at and be like Smash that. Right? Did it. Did it. Did like, it. One of them, and I've told the story on the show before, but I'll share with you real quick. Sorry to totally interrupt you here. Um, Jennifer showed me a picture. My wife, she was with me at an event. She had taken a picture from the back of the room, a thousand people in the room or something. I'm on stage at the front. It's got the screens and everything else. And anyways, this picture was on our vision board from the goal setting time. Like, the, you know, when we created it the year prior kind of thing, like we do it in November for the year coming up. The event was probably... I don't know, a few months later or something. And we're at the airport. She's like, oh my God, look at this. And I'm like, what? And she shows me the picture. I thought, that is crazy, right? And we've had a bunch of those happen. Yeah, it happens. It does. So when you're looking at manifesting something for yourself, again, you have to create the vision. You have the vision in your brain. Then you're going to set the goal. I want this to happen. And then you work your strategy backwards. In order for this to happen, this, 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 and this needs to happen. And you put it out there. 
and you look at your vision board and you look at your goals every day and you start working a plan. Now, the key is when you work your plan is, is simple because once you start working it and you have your network of people and you talk about what it is that you're doing, all of a sudden you are literally going to see it's like the universe just comes and boom, this is a puzzle piece. And the next one comes and boom, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle and it all just kind of moves everything into place. And then before you know it, you've got this perfect little picture, but it really is manifestation works because you're putting positive energy out into the universe, which is attracting what it is that you want. We always attract what it is that we want. And we also even attract the things that we don't want. So it's super important to keep your verbiage straight. Um, There's a new manifestation that I just uh, saw last night. It's on TikTok. Love it. If you don't have it, you should get it. TikTok, don't stop. It says, I don't chase. I attract what belongs to me will find me. Mm-hmm. So there's lots of affirmations or lots of positive manifestation sentences that you can use, find whatever works for you, but work it as a program because what will end up happening is the right people are going to show up. Um, but again, with the, with the wrong stuff, it's like um, you, if you're worrying, worrying brings more worry. So if you're worried about paying your bills, how am I going to pay my bills? I've got all these bills. Are gonna, uh, you're going to just get more bills because that's what you're focused on. Instead, if you're in debt, make a list of what you're in debt with take a payment plan to pay everything off. You make that monthly payment plan, pay off your highest interest rate credit cards debt first and work your way backwards with the minimum payments on everything else. You pay once a month, you do it, it's done. You don't think about it again. You're not worrying about it. Now you're working your plan. Mm -hmm. You've got to keep the focus on where you're at. And I always use a lot of horse analogies because I'm a rider, but on horses, if you want to get, if I need to get from this end of the arena to that end of the arena, I need to focus on that end of the arena and I need to look at where it is that I'm going because if on my horse, my horse is my vehicle. If I look over this way, my horse is going to go that way. So if you as a person look off this way and your goal is there and you're looking at something else, whatever it may be over here, you're not looking at your goal anymore. You're distracted. So you're taking your energy off of where you want to go and you're focusing someplace that's not going to get you any closer to where you want to go. So it's just very, very important that you stay focused on what you're doing And with any type of manifestation, even positive attitude, everybody falls off. You do. It just happens. Um, It's happened to me. It happens to you. It's just, we all have bad days, but Mm -hmm. you know, if you can just keep that mindset going, it will all just come to you in time. It's a beautiful thing. I, that, you know, just that you closed off there. I think that was real important as well, because I, I am a complete believer in the manifestation, the gratitude, the goal setting, uh, the law of attraction. And it's because of the fact that once you actually clue into it and you start to live it, you actually start to see it come to life. You experience it. And now for anybody to look at you and say, oh, it's all woo woo, you know, you're too far off and, and this stuff doesn't work. Okay. No, it does. It does. <laughs> and, and you can't tell me it doesn't because I've been doing it. Right. Um, but what you also just added or not, but however, that said, whatever, um, what you just also added to that was how important it is to understand that you will fall off every once in a while. And sure. that's okay. Right. That the, yeah. I guess talking to somebody who rides horses, you just got to get back on the horse. Right. You get back in the saddle again. Just get back on. Like, even for me, I legit coach. I'll tell a quick story. I legitimately talk to people every single day of the week who call me and say, Oh, my competitor just did this. She launched a big sale. She undercut me and I'm going out of business and she hates me and I don't know why she's doing this. And I'm like, Oh, let me give you some sisterhood. She doesn't (laughs) probably doesn't even know you exist. Number one, don't focus on her because you're going to fall off your horse. Keep going straight ahead with what it is that you are doing. So I teach people that every single day of the week. And when I started riding horses, of course, I got a big mouth and I'm a huge competitor. And I got up on stage in front of three or 400 people and started, you know, spouting off that I, I'm riding horses. I'm going to go win a buckle. And I got up there and told everybody that And that that year I lost 12 times. I mean, uh, I was last place, last place in every single event that I did, all 12 uh, of them. Now, most people would say, um, mm, you suck and yeah. you should probably hang your saddle up. But I was like, no, no this is my goal. I'm manifesting this. This is what I'm going to do. I saw an equine performance coach. She gave me a test. I took the test. She's like, you've got the best attitude about competition I've ever seen, except for one area. And I said, I don't fail tests. I will do that again. I can do better. And she's like, no, no, like this is going to change your life. Are you ready? And she's I'm like, share with me, what am I doing? She's like, you're horribly obsessed with your competitors. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you're focused on your competitor instead of focused on your goal. And I was like, 
wait a minute, you don't understand. This is my soapbox. This is literally what I'm known for in my coaching with people is not talking, not worrying about your competitor. So you're saying that I'm, I am doing, oh my God, I'm doing the exact thing that I teach people not to do. I did. And I understood why I was doing it and they were competing below their class level. So there was legitimate reasons Mm -hmm. why I thought that, but it didn't matter because what I'm supposed to do is what practice, what I preach, set my goal with myself and my horse for that day, work that goal and that strategy that day. Don't get blindsided by anybody else's distractions, focus on what I want and do it. The next year I came back my first event. I was first place. I didn't finish less than fourth and I won a state championship. Oh, and I got amazing. my buckle. See that. So it's, it works people, but people, I, you fall off your routines. You have to keep the positiveness in your life. Um, you know, if you lay down with dogs, you get fleas. So be very careful about who you surround yourself, what you put in your brain. Um, make sure it's positive. Make sure you're not being overloaded in the news cycles all the time. Um, just Keep feeding yourself the positivity that you need. And we always go off on our, our negative tangents. Everybody does it. Um, you do it. I do it. Barbara Corcoran does it. We all do it. But you just got to get right back out there. You can have your little moments. You just don't want to make it a lifestyle of negativity. And then you can have prosperity. Great, great, great advice. Um, I, I'm, you, you're absolutely right. We could talk on that topic for hours alone, guaranteed. Uh, but Risa Khan is coming up. Yes. Uh, this is coming up end of the month, I believe it is. End right? of the month. September end of the month. 30th, October 1st. There we go. So what what does everybody need to know about it? Why should they join us, us, and how do they do so? Absolutely. So David Greenspan is going to be speaking at yeah. RisaCon. He is one of our keynote speakers. Exciting. So glad to have you. Uh, so you. we're going to talk about everything that you talk about, uh, mindshare and branding and growing your business and scaling it, all those great things. We have uh, six keynote speakers We have one education panel session. We have 20 on-demand sessions. We have literally this morning, I didn't even have the list in front of me, but we've got PR, we've got marketing, we've got sales, we've got branding, we've got mindshare, we've got, you name it, profits, contracts, risk, social media, every subject that you could possibly think of for your business, we've got at RisaCon and it's all on-demand, it's virtual. So the on-demand sessions you're going to get in advance of September 30th. So the week of September 30th, you'll have them. Uh, we have them up for, I think, four to six months. I can't remember. I know my team's going to kill me because I don't know that. Uh, <laughs> we'll say four to six. Maybe it's hopefully it's six. Keep your fingers crossed. It's only 249 bucks. So it's like wow. super cheap. Yeah, totally. And this is uh, just stagers, stagers and realtors. Real estate agents, if you find uh, homeowners probably wouldn't be so much interested, but definitely real estate agents who are interested in staging, there's definitely a lot of great information. And if you don't want to do the entire conference, which covers everything for $249, you can buy some individual sessions for less. So if you only want one, you can just go buy one. Probably a ton more value in just buying the full ticket. So make sure you get over there. Um, And where do they go to get those tickets? RisaConvention.com. RisaConvention.com. So make sure you go over there, grab your tickets. Again, open to all stagers, whether you're north or south of the border, uh, as well as to any realtors that are interested in the world of staging and learning about, uh, well, learning about a lot of things you probably should know. Um, so how do you know, how do you know it's been a successful day for you? Oh gosh. The first thing that's came to my mind, I don't walk upstairs bawling my eyes out, but you know what a successful day to me is, uh, you know, one that goes by quickly that, uh, cause I feel like when my day flies by is when I've been most productive. Um, so I don't like to wake up late. I like to get up. I like to get at my desk early, get the job done. Uh, if I sleep in, even on the weekends, I feel lazy when I sleep in, even though I need to sleep in sometimes. Uh, but it, just a good day is one that you are just rocking and rolling and chugging along all day long and you're yip-yapping with what you need to do. And it all just flows really, really well. And the more people that I can touch and help, that's the cherry on top of my Sunday. I, I didn't say it, everybody. She said it. Um, I don't know how often you tune in, but I will tell you that we are batting a thousand still. Thank you for helping us on that. Uh, not a single person brings up money every time I ask that question. And everybody who listens to this show regularly knows I ask that question at the end of every single show just to see what is the response. And everybody who's had any type of success in this world uses that four-letter word called help. You just help. did it. Um, so uh, well done. You passed the test. No, seriously, though, it's uh, 
it's, 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 again, it's a very common theme from people that are, are doing well out there is around, you know, success in your day doesn't revolve around the money it revolves around what can you do to help others? Absolutely. Right. And we talk That's about awesome. law of attraction. When you focus right. on service, when you are serving others, the money is going to come. You just don't focus on the money. You focus on the satisfaction of the job and the satisfaction of what it is you're doing and everything else just falls into place. But when people focus on the money, it's like, I've not balanced my checkbook in over 30 years. I just don't, just I won't. Because if I balance my checkbook and I'm focused on the money, you focus on what you don't have. And then you feel empty all the time. But when I, since I don't, I don't ever do it, but I always have money. And it's like, if I know when it's getting low, you just fill it back up. So money's world is full of money. Just go find it. <laughs> Last words, tips, uh, anything for everybody that's tuned in to help themselves get out there, grow their mindset, build some mind share, grow their business. Parting words uh, from Michelle. Absolutely. Number one way to do all of that is just be authentic be passionate about what it is that you do and uh, keep consistent in your messaging and your service to others. And it will come back tenfold. I love it. I love it. Um, where can people get a hold of you if they want to ask you any questions or connect with you on any of the stuff that you talked about today? Uh, maybe get the book, whatever it be. Where would you like to direct people? Absolutely. You can go to realestatestagingassociation.com. It's our website. Uh, you can look under the contacts, my email, my phone number is listed there. Call myself, anybody on the team. We're always happy to be of service. Amazing. Shell, thank you. Really appreciate you taking the time today for the show. And uh, we've got an exciting month together coming up and I'm looking forward to it. And again, uh, Risa Khan is going to be awesome. So thanks yeah. for the time cool. today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. You're either listening to this on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or maybe you went to my website, MindShare101.com. And while you're on my site, make sure to download your free copy of the Ultimate Marketing Bundle for Realtors. This is a 31-page ebook packed with a ton of tips and tricks for you. Plus, there's a ready-to-go 90-day social media content calendar to help you build more MindShare so that you can get more market share. And if you want to talk about personalized one-to-one -one coaching to help you get to your next level, just get in touch with me. We'll set up a free consultation call, learn more about what you're looking to achieve and well, how I will help you do just that. Also, don't forget that our push 100 is on. So be sure to please go to iTunes, subscribe to the show, rate us and leave a review. And if you haven't yet, connect with me on Facebook at Mindshare101 and on Instagram at David Greenspan 101. I want to once again thank Virginia Munden and the Buzz Conference for sponsoring today's episode. Make sure you connect with the Buzz Conference by visiting their website, www.thebuzzconference.com and by following them on Instagram at The Buzz Conference to keep tabs on all the awesome events they are always hosting, along with getting the latest copy of The Buzz Digital Magazine. I also want to thank Kids Keep in Touch Systems for sponsoring today's episode. If you haven't checked this out yet, just go to my site, mindshare101.com and click on marketing. This has been another episode of the Mindshare Podcast. Thank you for tuning in.